Chapter 14 I am not inclined to panics, but the situation in which I now found myself tended to induce that state to a greater degree than any other which I can recall in my long experience in this savage world of danger. Here I was, in a palace from which I could not find my way without a guide, surrounded by maniacs, all of whom were potential enemies, but the most terrifying feature of the situation lay in the fact that Dien would most assuredly be lost were I not able to return to her. I reproached myself for thus jeopardizing her safety for two who really had no hold upon my loyalty, other than that dictated by a sense of decency and common humanity. Right then, I would have sacrificed them both without a single qualm of conscience, could I, by such means, have returned to Dien. I realized that I had overestimated both my luck and my cunning. The former seemed to have deserted me, and the latter was about to be nullified by the still more cunning minds of madmen. Finally, I decided to try to bluff it through. I knew that Zor would be with me if it came to a fight, and I also knew that if we should try to fight our way from the palace, the reactions of the Jukins were unpredictable. I drew my knife and looked Bruma straight in the eyes. You are not going to sacrifice me to Ogre, I said in a loud tone of voice that attracted the attention of all around us, including Misa, the king. Why? demanded Bruma. Because I am a guest of Misa. I replied, and I demand his protection. Who is this man? cried the king. His name is Napolapart, replied Bruma, and he comes from Gamba. I shall sacrifice him to Ogre, so that Ogre will tell us what has become of Moko, your son. I was facing away from Misa at the time because I was looking at Bruma and listening to him. Beyond the crowd I could see the doorway leading into the throne room. The backs of nearly all except those on the dais upon which Misa sat were toward the door, and the attention of those on the dais was riveted upon Bruma and me, thus I was the only one to see a cadaverous figure stagger from the corridor and lean weakly against the frame of the doorway. Will Ogre tell us where Moko is if you offer this sacrifice to him? demanded Misa of Bruma. If the sacrifice is acceptable to Ogre, he will tell us, replied the high priest. If it is not acceptable, we shall have to try another. I turned toward Misa. You do not need Ogre to tell you where Moko is, I said, for I can tell you. Will you let Zor and me go in peace if I tell you? Yes, said the king. I turned and pointed toward the doorway. There is Moko, I said. All eyes turned in the direction I had pointed to see Moko stagger forward into the room. He looked like a cadaver temporarily endowed with the power of locomotion. His body and his extremities were very thin, and his body was literally covered with blood that had dried and caked upon it from a now partially healed wound below his heart. So I hadn't killed Moko after all, and now by an ironical trick of fate, he had come back, perhaps to save me. I watched him stagger across the room to Misa's throne, where he sank to the floor exhausted. Where have you been? demanded the king. There was nothing in his voice that denoted paternal affection or sympathy. Weak, gasping for breath, Moko replied in a feeble whisper. He tried to kill me. When I regained consciousness, I was in darkness for he had dragged me into the corridor of which only the king and his son have knowledge. He was gone, and with him the girl from Sari. Who was he? demanded Misa. I do not know, replied Moko. It must have been the man, David, who escaped from the cell in which he was confined, suggested Bruma. We shall find them, said Misa. Send warriors out to search the forest for them, and search in the great cave in the ravine of the kings. Immediately warriors started for the door, and Zor and I joined them. I do not believe that Bruma saw us go, as his attention was fixed upon Moko over whom he was chanting some weird jargon, doubtless something in the nature of a healing incantation. What shall we do? asked Zor. We must find Cleto, I replied and then try to leave the village with these warriors, pretending that we are going out to help search for David. You can't get a woman out of the village, said Zor. Don't you remember what Cleto told us? That's right, I replied. I had forgotten, but I have another way. What is it? It is the corridor through which I escaped before, but the only trouble is that it leads to the large cave which they are going to search. What became of the girl from Sari? he asked. I took her with me and hid her in another cave near the large one. Of course, you are going to take her with us? Absolutely, I replied. 
for when I found her with Moko, I made an amazing discovery. What was that? asked Zor. That the girl from Sari was actually my mate, Dian the Beautiful. It was a fortunate chance then that caused you to be captured by the Jukins. We found Cleto in the kitchen of the Major Domo. She was surprised and delighted to see us, but at first she could scarcely believe that it was I, so greatly had Diane's handiwork disguised me. She had not recognized me when she met my guide and me in the corridor, but she recalled having seen us pass. We talked matters over and decided to enter the corridor and go as far as the rear entrance to the cave. There we should wait until the Jukins had completed their investigation and left. We were quite sure that they would not investigate the corridor, but if they did, we should simply have to keep ahead of them so as not to be detected, even if we had to come all the way back to the entrance. Now, however, another obstacle presented itself. None of us knew how to reach the entrance to the corridor. Neither Zor nor Cleto had ever been there, and I could not retrace my steps to it, even though my life and Diane's depended upon it. We shall have to attempt to pass out through the city then, said Zor. You two go then, said Cleto. I am sure that they would not permit me to pass. There must be some other way, said Zor. There is, I said. You and I will go out of the village to search for David. When the Jukins have finished their search in the ravine of the kings, we can enter the cave and come back for Cleto, for after you have found your way from the corridor to these quarters, you could easily retrace your steps, while I could not. It is a good plan, said Zor, but it will not be necessary for you to come back with me and leave your mate, for all I shall have to do is guide Cleto out of the palace, and it will not require two men for that. That is right, said Cleto, but I do not wish you to risk your lives for me. I never expected to escape anyway, so you might as well go along and make sure of yours. David has already risked his life and that of his mate to come back here to rescue us, said Zor. We shall take you with us if it is possible to do so. We left Cleto and went out into the city, presently finding ourselves at the outer gate. As warriors were still passing through in search of me, we had no trouble in leaving the city. We found the ravine of the kings full of searching warriors, so we joined them in order to be near Dien and learn if she were discovered. If she is, I said, we shall have to fight, for I shall not permit her to be taken back into the city alive. Mingling with the Jukins and pretending to be hunting for myself, I made my way close to the cave where Dien was hidden. The barricade was still up, and the brush covered it. Nothing had been disturbed. Inside that cave, not ten feet from me, was the woman I loved, the only woman I had ever loved, the only woman I ever should love. She was doubtless worrying as much about my safety as I had worried about hers, and yet I dared not call out to let her know that I was there, close to her and safe, for all about us were the Jukins. I saw some of them descending from the large cave, so I knew they had made their investigation there, and that it would be safe for Zor to enter as soon as the searchers had left the ravine and make his way through the corridor to the interior of the palace. There may not be any such thing as time in Pellucidor, but I think an eternity must have passed before the Jukins gave up their search in the ravine and left it. Zor and I had managed to conceal ourselves without appearing to do so, so that no one noticed that we remained behind when the others left. And now, I said to Zor, you can make your attempt to reach Cleto and bring her back here. The entrance to the corridor is directly opposite the mouth of the cave. After you enter the corridor, always keep your left hand against the wall, and you will be bound to retrace my steps through the palace and the corridor. I stopped aghast as a recollection came suddenly to my mind. What's the matter? demanded Zor, noticing my perturbation. How stupid of me to have forgotten! I exclaimed. What are you talking about? he demanded. You will not be able to pass the gate at the farther end of the corridor, I said. It was behind that gate that I was imprisoned, and it defied my every effort to batter it down. Is there no other way? he asked. Yes, there is, but I do not know how you can find it. There is a doorway from the corridor to the room in which I found Moko and Dien. Perhaps you will feel it and recognize it when you come to it, but as I recall it, it seems only a part and parcel of the wooden wall that faces most of the corridor. It is, I should say, about halfway between the cave and the far end of the corridor. If the gate is still locked, I shall find that door, Zor assured me. Your chances will be mighty slim if you have to go that way, I told him, 
because I am sure that that room lay in the quarters of either Moko or Misa, for it was near there that they had Yen imprisoned. If you are discovered there, you will certainly be destroyed. Perhaps you had better give up the idea entirely. If the gate at the end of the corridor is still fastened, we shall then have done all that we humanly could to bring Clito out. If I am not back at the end of two sleeps, said Zor, I shall never be back, and you and your mate may commence your journey to Sari. I bade him goodbye then with a heavy heart, and watched him climb the tree and enter the mouth of the large cave above. Chapter 15 As soon as Zor had started upon his mission, I returned to the cave where Dien was hidden, and making sure that no one was in sight in the ravine, I started removing the brush and the barricade. As I was doing so, I called to her, but receiving no reply I presumed that she was asleep, and so I proceeded to remove the remainder of the barrier as quietly as possible so as not to disturb her, for sleep in Pellucidor is precious. I do not know when I have been as happy as I was at that moment. My spirits were high, for now it seemed certain to me that we had an excellent chance of escaping from the Valley of the Jukins and returning to our beloved Sari. When I had made an opening large enough to admit my body, I crawled into the cave backwards and replaced the barrier as best I could, intending to lie down beside Dien and get a little sleep myself. How surprised she would be when she awakened to find me there beside her. I couldn't resist the temptation to reach out and touch her. The cave was small, and she could not possibly be more than an arm's length from me, but though I felt in all directions I did not find her. It was then that the terrible truth dawned upon me. Dien was gone. To be cast from such heights of hopefulness to such a depth of despair almost unnerved me. More like a maniac than a sane man, I felt over every inch of the floor of the cave. I found some food and water. I found my weapons too but no Dien. No longer was there thought of sleep, no longer thoughts of Zor or Clito, only Dien mattered now. Taking a spear and the bow and arrows that I had made for myself, I pushed away the barrier and came out into the open. For a moment I stood there undecided. Where was I to look for Dien? Something seemed to tell me, I do not know what that she had not been taken back into the village, and I decided to go down the ravine away from the village, which was the direction that we should have taken to leave the valley of the Jukins on our way towards Sari. That much I knew because I had asked Dien the direction of our country, and she had told me which way we must go to reach it. All through the ravine of the kings, the ground had recently been walked over by the searching Jukins so that any possible trace of Diane's spore would have been obliterated, but I hoped that if I went far enough I might eventually pick it up, for not having the homing instinct of the Pelucidarians, I had been forced to develop myself into an excellent tracker. I could follow a spore that an ordinary man could not detect and I banked heavily upon this ability to pick the spore of Dien and whomever had stolen her. I came to the end of the Jukin forest without meeting man or beast, or finding any trace of Dien. According to Diane's directions, I turned right here and skirted the forest. She had told me that this would lead me to the far end of the valley where I should come upon a stream, and that I should follow this stream to a small inland sea into which it emptied, then I was to follow the shore of this sea to the left. Eventually, I would see a lofty mountain peak far ahead of me, which would indicate the direction of Sari. After that, I should have to depend upon my own resourcefulness to find my way for she could not recall any other outstanding landmark, for she, born with the homing instinct, had not needed to particularly note any of them. I had reached the lower end of the valley and the river without seeing any trace of Dien, and had just about come to the conclusion that I had been wrong in assuming that she had been brought in this direction, whereas it was equally possible that she might have been captured by the Jukins and returned to the village. Should I return to Mises' village or should I go on? That was the question. My better judgment told me that I should turn back, but I finally decided to go on yet a little farther, but eventually I gave it up as hopeless and turned back. The forest in the valley of the Jukin stops rather abruptly where it meets the plain, although a few scattered trees dot the latter. For purposes of better concealment, I traveled just inside the edge of the forest where the plain was always visible to me and trees always within easy reach as avenues of escape from the more dangerous carnivores. From the village of Misa to the lower end of the valley, where I had turned back, must be about twenty miles. I had been without sleep for some time and being practically exhausted, I sought out a tree in which I could rig myself up a sleeping platform well concealed by verdure from prying eyes, and far enough above the ground to be safe from hunting beasts, and here I was soon asleep. I do not know how long I slept, 
But when I awoke I found that it had rained, for the forest was dripping with water. That the rain had not awakened me was evidence of how exhausted I must have been. But now I was refreshed, and soon I was on the ground once more, ready to continue my return journey toward the village of Misa, the king. I was refreshed, and I was also ravenously hungry, which was an approximate index as to the length of time I had slept. As I did not care to take the time to hunt, I gathered a little fruit with the intention of eating it on the way, but almost immediately after reaching the ground, I discovered that which drove all thought of hunger from my mind, for passing directly beneath my tree were footprints of a man and woman in the rain-soaked earth, a man and a woman who had been walking hurriedly toward the lower end of the valley. Instantly I cast aside all thought of returning to the village, convinced in my own mind that these were the footprints of Dien and her abductor. I could not tell how old the tracks were, for I could not know how long I had slept, but I knew that the rain had been comparatively recent and that the two people had passed either during or after the storm. This lack of means for measuring time here in Pellucidor can be extremely annoying and aggravating. I might have slept for a week of earthly time as far as I knew, and these people might be far in advance of me, or they might be but just a short distance ahead, hidden by the trees of the forest. As the trail remained quite distinct, I could follow it rapidly. In fact, I had adopted a dog trot which I had learned from experience that I could maintain for great lengths of time, as only thus could I hope to overtake them, as I could see that they had been hurrying. Near the lower end of the valley, the trail came out of the forest, and then far ahead I saw two figures, as yet too far away from me to recognize. Now I no longer trotted, I ran. Often I lost sight of them for a considerable time as one or the other of us dropped down into swales or hollows, but each time that they reappeared I could see that I had gained on them. At length, after losing sight of them for a short time, I topped a rise and saw them just below me. They were standing in a clearing facing a couple of jalaks, the fierce, wild dogs of Pellucidor, and then it was that I recognized them, Zor and Cleto, armed only with their crude, stone knives. They were hopelessly facing the two great brutes that were slinking toward them. Their situation would have been almost hopeless had I not happened upon them in the nick of time, and even now it was none too certain that we should all three escape alive, for the Jalak is an animal of great strength and terrible ferocity. They are man-eaters of the worst type, and hunt men in preference to any other game. As I ran down the hill toward Zor and Cleto their backs were toward me as they stood facing the brutes, and so they did not see me nor did they hear my sandaled feet on the soft turf. The Jalaks paid no attention to me, as they have little or no fear of man, and probably looked upon me as just another victim. As I ran, I fitted an arrow to my bow, and when I was quite sure that I was safely in range I stopped a few paces behind Zor and Cleto and drew a bead on the larger Jalak, a huge dog which stood a good six inches higher than his mate. I drew the shaft back until the tip of the arrow touched my left hand. The bowstring twanged and the arrow sank deep in the chest of the dog. Simultaneously, Zor and Cleto wheeled about and recognized me, and both Jalaks charged. With a celerity born of long-continued, urgent need of self-preservation, I had fitted another arrow to my bow and driven it into the breast of the she. The shot brought her down, but the dog, growling ferociously, the arrow protruding from his breast, came leaping toward us. It was then, when he was almost upon us, that I hurled my spear, a short, heavy javelin-like weapon. Fortunately for us, my aim was true, and this heavier missile brought the great beast down, and a second later I put an arrow through his heart. Similarly, I dispatched the female. Zor and Cleto were profuse in the expression of their gratitude. They were mystified as to how it had happened that I had been behind them. They said that they had gone to the cave where Dien had been hidden, and found it empty and immediately had come to the conclusion that she and I had started on toward Sari. Then I told them how it had happened that I had been behind them and of my fear that Dien had been stolen, and then when I had not been able to find any trace of her spore I had become convinced that she had been taken back into the village. No, said Cleto, I can assure you that she has not. I should have heard of it immediately. Had she been brought into the Major Domo's quarters? warriors talking as they returned from the search, and it was quite evident from what they said that they had found no trace of her, so I think that you may rest assured that she is not in the village of Misa. Well it was of course something of a relief to know that, but where was she? 
And who had been her abductor? I recalled that Moko had wanted her to run away with him, and I questioned Cleto as to the possibility of its having been he who had found her hiding place and taken her away. It is possible, she said. But he had been badly wounded. The last time I saw him, he was so weak he could scarcely stand. Oh, he has had plenty of time to recover from that, she said. I shook my head in despair. This baffling question of elapsed time was maddening. To me, it seemed that not more than two days had elapsed since I saw Moko fall exhausted at the foot of his father's throne. Yet Cleto assured me that there had been plenty of time for his wound to heal. How was I possibly to know, then, how long it had been since Dien had been taken from the cave? If another than Moko had taken her, it might have been a great many days ago, as measured by outer earthly time. If it were Moko, it might not have been so long ago. But still, he might have had ample time to take her where I should never find her. The fact that I could find no trace of her spore was the most disheartening fact of all. Yet I realized that she still might have passed this way but so long ago that all traces of her passage had been obliterated. What are you going to do? asked Zor. I am going back to Sari, I replied, and I am going to bring an army here to the Valley of the Jukins and wipe their accursed race off the face of Pellucidor. Their hereditary taint of insanity is a menace to all mankind. And you? I asked. Where are you going? I suppose I shall never find Rana, he replied. It seems hopeless now to prosecute the search any further. Cleto has asked me to come back to Suvi with her, he added, in what I thought was a rather embarrassed manner. Then we can continue on together, I said, for Suvi lies in the direction of Sari, and with Cleto as a guide, my great handicap will be nullified. What do you mean? she asked. He can't find his way home, said Zor, laughing as though it were a huge joke. Cleto opened her eyes in amazement. You mean you could not find your way back to Sari alone? I'm sorry, I replied, but I couldn't. I never heard of such a thing, said Cleto. He says he is from another world, said Zor. At first, I did not believe him, but now that I have come to know him, I do not doubt his word. What other world is there? demanded Cleto. He says that Pellucidor is round like the eggs of one of the great turtles, and hollow too. Pellucidor, he says, is on the inside, and his world is on the outside. Can't anyone in your world then find his way home if he gets lost? asked the girl. Yes, I explained, but not in the way that you do. Sometime I shall explain it to you, but right now we have other things to think about, and the most important at the moment is to get as far away from the Valley of the Jukins as we can. We started on again then on the long trail toward Sari and I should have been very happy and contented, had it not been for my anxiety concerning the fate of Dien. If I only knew in what direction she had been taken, even to know who had taken her would have been some satisfaction, but I knew neither and I could not even guess, and prayed that time would unravel the mystery. We had passed out of the valley and followed the river down to the shore of the inland sea, of which Dien had told me, when we passed the skeleton of a large deer from which all the flesh had been stripped by the carnivorous creatures of all sizes and descriptions which infest Pellucidor. So often does one come across these bleaching evidences of tragedy in Pellucidor that they occasion no comment or even a single glance, but as I passed close to this one I saw an arrow lying among the bones. Naturally, I picked it up to put it in my quiver, and as I did so, I must have exclaimed aloud in astonishment, for both Zor and Cleto turned questioningly toward me. What is the matter? asked the former. I made this arrow, I said. I made it for Dien. I always mark our arrows for identification. This one bears her mark. Then she has been this way, said Cleto. Yes, she is on the way back to Sari, I said. Then I got to thinking. It was odd that it had never occurred to me before, that I had found my weapons in the cave but not Diane's. Why should her abductor have taken her weapons and not mine? I put the question to Zor and Cleto. Perhaps she came alone, suggested Cleto. She would never have deserted me, I said. Zor shook his head. I do not understand it, he said. Very few of the men of Pellucidor know how to use this strange weapon which you make. The Jukins certainly possess none. Who else could have shot this but Dien the Beautiful herself? She must have shot it, I said. But if she were stolen, her captor would never permit her to carry weapons. 
argued Sor. You are right, I said. Then she must be alone, said Sor. Or, or she came away with someone of her own free will. I couldn't believe that, but no matter how much I racked my brain, it was impossible for me to arrive at any explanation. Chapter 16 It is remarkable how life adapts itself to its environment, and I may say especially man, who is entirely hairless and unprotected from the elements and comparatively slow and weak. Here was I, a man of the 20th century, with perhaps a thousand years of civilization as my background, trekking through the wildernesses of a savage world with a man and a girl of the old stone age, and quite as self-reliant and as much at home as they. I, who would not have ventured upon the streets of my native city in my shirt sleeves, was perfectly comfortable, and not at all self-conscious, in a g-string and a pair of sandals. It has often made me smile to contemplate what my straight-laced New England friends would have thought, could they have seen me, and I know that they would have considered Cleto an abandoned wench, yet like practically every girl I have ever known here in Pellucidor, she was fine and clean, and virtuous almost to prudery, but she did have a failing, a failing that is not uncommon to all girls on the outer crust, she talked too much. Yet her naive and usually happy prattle often distracted my mind from the sorrow which weighed it down. Having found that I was from another world, Cleto must know all about it, and she asked a million questions. She was a very different Cleto from the Cleto I had known in the palace of Misa, the king, for then she was suppressed by the seeming hopelessness of her position and her fear of the maniacs among whom she lived, but now that she was free and safe, the natural buoyancy of her spirits reasserted itself and the real Cleto bloomed again. It was quite evident to me that Zor had fallen in love with Cleto, and there is no doubt but what the little rascal led him on. There are coquettes wherever there are women. It was impossible to tell if she were in love with him, but I think she was because she treated him so badly. Anyway, I know it was she who suggested that he go to Suvi. Why did you leave Suvi, Cleto? I once asked her. I ran away, she said with a shrug. I wanted to go to Cali, but I got lost, and so I wandered around until I was finally captured by the Jukins. If you were lost, said Zor, why didn't you go back to Suvi? I was afraid, replied Cleto. Afraid of what? I asked. There was a man there that wished to take me as his mate, but I did not want him, but he was a big strong man and his uncle was king of Suvi. It was because of him that I ran away, and because of him that I dared not go back. But now you are not afraid to return? I asked. I shall have you and Zor with me, she said, and so I shall not be afraid. Is this man by any chance named Dugat? I asked. Yes, she said. Do you know him? No, I said. But some day I am going to meet him. It was a strange coincidence that both Dien and Cleto had been captured by the Jukins while they were trying to escape from Dugat. The fellow would have plenty to account for to Zor and me. Once again it was, to me, new country that we were passing through. In fact, so enormous is the land area of Pulsitor. So sparsely peopled is it, and so little explored, that almost all of it is new country practically untouched by man. It is, however, a vast melting pot of life where animals of nearly all the geological periods of the outer crust exist contemporaneously. I have been told that there are considerable areas entirely destitute of animal life, and I know that there are others where the reptilia of the Triassic and Jurassic ages of the outer crust reign in undisputed possession because no other creature dare enter their domain. Other areas are peopled solely by the birds and mammals that flourished on the outer crust from the Cretaceous to the Pliocene, but by far the larger part of the Pellucidor known to me from my own exploration and from hearsay is inhabited by all these forms of life, with here and there an isolated community of men living mostly in caves. Only since the founding of the empire had there been anything approaching a city built in Pellucidor, unless one might call the underground caverns of the Mahar cities, or apply the same name to the crazy conglomeration of huts occupied by the Jukins. One city only must always be accepted from this very general statement. That is the city of Corsar, near the North Polar Opening, which I believe to have been originally founded by the crew of a pirate ship which, by some miracle, found its way through the polar opening from the Arctic Ocean into Pellucidor. The civilization of these people, however, has never spread toward the south. They are, by nature, a maritime people but having no sun or moon or stars to guide them, 
They do not dare venture out of sight of land on the great ocean that lies at their very door, the Corsar AZ. We had slept many times, and were still moving along the shore of the sea, when we came suddenly upon a group of enormous mastodons in a little flat-floored valley through which a river ran. There were three mastodons in the group, a bull, a cow, and a calf, and we could see by the actions of the adults that something was amiss, for they kept running back and forth, trumpeting loudly. We were about to give them a wide berth, when I discovered the cause of their excitement. The calf had wandered into a slough near the edge of the river, and had become mired down. It would have been suicide for either the cow or the bull, with their tremendous weight, to have ventured into the soft ground in an effort to save the calf. Like most people, I am sentimental about young animals, and when I heard that poor little fellow bawling, my heart went out to him. Let's see if we can get him out of there, I said to Zor. And get killed for our pains, replied the man from Zoram. Old Mai is pretty intelligent, I said. I think he would know that we were trying to help. Zor shrugged. Sometimes I think that you are really a Jukin, he said laughing. You have some of the craziest ideas. Oh well, I said. If you're afraid, of course. Who said I was afraid? demanded Zor. That was enough. I knew that he would come with me now if he died for it, for the men of Zoram are especially jealous of their reputation for bravery, so I started down toward the mastodons, and both Zor and Cleto came with me. I didn't go very close to them at first but down to the edge of the marsh about a hundred yards from them where I could look over the ground and ascertain if there were any possibilities of helping the calf. At this point there was only about twenty feet of marsh between solid ground and the river, and it was covered with driftwood that had been deposited there during high water. The surface of the marsh had dried out under the hot sun, and after testing this crust I found that it would support our weight, so the only feasible plan whereby we might get the calf out was obvious. I explained it to Zor and Cleto, and then the three of us set about gathering larger pieces of driftwood which we placed in front of the calf to form something of a corduroy road from it to the solid ground. At first, the little fellow was frightened and started plunging when we approached him, but presently he seemed to sense that we were not going to harm him and quieted down. The bull and cow were also very much excited at first, but after a while they stopped their trumpeting and stood watching us. I think they realized what we were trying to do. The last few feet of our improvised road had to be laid down within a few feet of them, and was in easy reach of their trunks, but they did not offer to molest us. With the road completed came the job of trying to get the calf onto it. He probably weighed at least a ton, so lifting him was out of the question. Zor and I found a large log and laid it parallel and close to him. We got a long piece of driftwood that was staunch and strong, the bowl of a small tree, placed one end across the log and slowly worked it under one of his forelegs. In the meantime, Cleto, following my instructions, was ready with the largest piece of driftwood she could lift. Zor and I got on the outer end of our lever and threw all our weight onto it. Time and again we repeated this, until finally the leg commenced to pull out of the muck, and as soon as it was free, Cleto shoved the piece of driftwood beneath it. The calf then tried to scramble out on the roadway, but he couldn't quite make it, and so we went around to the other side and repeated the operation on his other foreleg. This was easier because he could help himself a little now with his free leg and as soon as he had both of them on solid footing he wallowed around for a moment and finally dragged himself out. I had never seen anything so touching as the solicitude of the bull and cow when the little fellow finally stood beside them on solid ground. They felt him all over for a moment or two to see that he was all right, and then dragged him away from the edge of the marsh. Cleto, Zor, and I sat down on the big log to rest, for it had been fatiguing work. We expected the mammoths to go away, but they didn't. They stopped a couple of hundred feet from us and watched us. After we had rested, we started on again, looking for a place to cross the river, and as soon as we did the bull started toward us, followed by the cow and the calf. That didn't look so good, and we kept close to the edge of the marsh so that we could escape them if they showed any disposition to be nasty. We kept glancing back over our shoulders, and presently I noticed that the mastodons were not gaining on us. Apparently it was merely a coincidence that they were going in the same direction that we were. We had to go quite a little distance upriver before we found a place where we could make a safe crossing. It was not a very large river, and the bottom where we crossed was gravelly, 
When we reached the opposite bank, we saw that the mastodons were entering the river behind us. Well, they tagged along after us until we found a safe place to camp. They didn't approach very close to us at any time. And when we stopped, they stopped. It looks as though they were just following us, said Cleto. It certainly does, agreed Zor. But I wonder why. You've got me, I said. I don't think they intend to harm us. They don't show any signs of nervousness or excitement, such as they would if they were angry or afraid of us. Old Maj isn't afraid of anything, said Zor. Maj is the Pelucidarian name for the Mastodon. I'm going to see if they're friendly, I said. You better locate a nice tree before you try anything, said Zor, and be sure it's a big one. That old bull could uproot almost anything around here. We had halted near some eaves where we intended to camp, and I figured that if the mastodons were inclined to be unfriendly I could beat them to the cave we had selected before they could overhaul me, at least I hoped so. I walked slowly toward them, and they just stood there looking at me without showing any signs of nervousness. When I was about a hundred feet from them, the calf started to come toward me, then the cow moved a little restlessly and made a funny little noise. I guess she was trying to call him back, but he came on, and I stood still and waited. He stopped two or three times and looked back at the cow and the bull, but each time he came on again and finally he stopped a few feet from me. He stuck his trunk way out in front of him, and I reached out my hand very slowly and touched it. I scratched it a little bit, and he came a step or two closer. I put my hand on his head then and scratched his forehead. He seemed to like it, but presently he started winding his trunk around me, and I did not like that, so I took it and unwound it forcibly. The bull and the cow hadn't moved, but believe me they were watching us. All of a sudden the cow raised her trunk and trumpeted, and the little fellow wheeled around and went lumbering back to her as fast as he could go, while I walked back and joined Zor and Cleto. That was the beginning of a very strange friendship, for when we awoke after our sleep the mastodons were still hanging around, and they tagged along behind us for every march after that for a long time. I used to talk to them a lot and call them my, and once when they were not near camp when we awoke after a sleep I shouted the name several times, and presently the three of them came out of the nearby forest, where they had evidently been feeding. We had become quite accustomed to them, and they to us with the result that they often came quite close to us. In fact I often stroked their trunks which for some reason they seemed to enjoy, but why they were following us we could not guess, nor did we ever know. The closest conjecture that I could arrive at was that they were grateful to us for having saved the calf from the marsh in which he would surely have died had we not come along. Their presence with us more than repaid us for our efforts in behalf of the calf, for while they were with us we were never once menaced by any of the many predatory animals which abound in the country through which we passed, as even the most savage of them respect the strength of Maj. We had slept many times since leaving the valley of the Jukins, so that I knew that we had traveled a considerable distance, when we prepared to make camp after a long march at the foot of a cliff in which there was a cave where we might find security while we slept. The remains of a campfire in front of the cave indicated that it had been used comparatively recently, and the face of the cliff beside the mouth of the cave bore evidence that a number of wayfarers had found shelter there in times past, for many of them had scratched their marks in the limestone, a custom which is quite prevalent among the more intelligent tribes of Pellucidor, where each individual has his own personal mark which answers the purpose of a signature. As I glanced at them casually, my attention was suddenly riveted upon one evidently made quite recently. It was an equilateral triangle with a dot in the center. It was Diane's mark. I called the attention of Cleto and Zor to it, and they became quite as excited as I. She has been here quite recently and alone, said Zor. What makes you think she was alone? I demanded. If there had been another with her, he also would have made his mark, replied Zor. But hers is the only one freshly made. Could it have been that Dien had deliberately deserted me? I could not believe it. And yet I knew that the evidence must seem conclusive to anyone who did not know Dien the Beautiful as well as I. Chapter 17 it was at this camp that the mastodons left us. When we awoke I called them many times, but they did not come, and I think we all felt a little depressed about it as we started off once more on the long trek toward Sari. For some inexplicable reason, I was haunted by a presentiment of evil after the mastodons left us, nor was I alone in this. Both Zor and Cleto shared my depression, 
as though to further accentuate our mood, the sky became overcast with dark and ominous clouds, and presently there broke upon us a terrific electrical storm. The wind howled about us, almost hurling us to the ground. The air was filled with flying leaves and branches, and the trees of the forest swayed and groaned ominously. Our situation was most precarious with trees crashing down all about us. The rain fell in great masses which swept against us with staggering force. I had never seen such a storm before in Pellucidor. Constantly buffeted by wind and water, we staggered on until at last we came to a comparatively open space which we felt would be far safer than the denser forest. Here we huddled together with our backs toward the storm, waiting like dumb creatures for the battle of the elements to subside. Great animals which ordinarily would have threatened our very existence passed close by us as they fled before the storm, but we had no fear of them for we knew that they were even more terrified than we, and that hunting and feeding were far from their thoughts. Aside from the danger from flying branches, we felt comparatively safe, and so were not as alert as customarily, although as a matter of course, we could have heard or seen little above the storm and the blinding rain. The crashing thunder, following peal after peal, almost continuously, combined with the howling wind to drown out any other sound. At the very height of the storm we were suddenly seized from behind by powerful fingers. Our weapons were wrenched from us and our hands secured behind our backs. Then at last we saw our captors. There were fifteen or twenty of them, the largest men I have ever seen. Even the smallest of them stood fully seven feet in height. Their faces were extremely ugly and a pair of great tusk-like yellow teeth imparted no additional beauty to them. They appeared to be very low in the scale of human evolution, being entirely naked and armed only with the most primitive weapons, a very crude stone knife and a club. In addition to these, each of them carried a grass rope. They paid no more attention to the storm than as though it did not exist, but they seemed mightily pleased over their capture. Good, grunted one, pinching Cleto's flesh. What do you intend doing with us? I demanded. One of them leaned close to me, leering and blowing his foul breath in my face. Eat you, he said. Stay out of Azar if you do not want to be eaten, said another. Azar, ejaculated Cleto. Oh, now I know. All my life I have heard of the man eating giants of Azar. There is no hope for us now, David. I must admit that the outlook was not very bright but it has been my custom never to abandon hope. I tried to cheer Cleto up a bit, and so did Zor, but we were not very successful, not even when the storm passed as quickly as it had broken upon us and the sun shone down again out of a clear sky, suggesting, as I told her, that our storm might clear and our good luck return as had the sun. The Azarians dragged us along through the forest, and presently we came to a palisade village, or rather, I should say, a palisade enclosure, for after we entered it we found there no sign of habitation whatsoever. The storm had wreaked quite a little havoc in the enclosure, several trees having been blown down, one of them having leveled a portion of the palisade. There were a number of Azarian women and children in the enclosure, all quite as uncouth and repulsive as the males, while tied to individual trees were several human beings like ourselves, evidently prisoners. Our captors tied us to trees and then set about rebuilding the damaged palisade. The women and children paid very little attention to us. A few of the former came up and pinched our flesh to see what condition we were in, an all too suggestive gesture. I was tied to a tree close to one of the prisoners who had been there before us, and I got into conversation with him. How long will it be, I asked him, before they eat us? He shrugged. When our flesh is in a condition that suits them, he replied, they feed us principally on nuts with a little fruit, and never give us any flesh. Do they abuse you? I asked. No, he replied, for that would retard our fattening. They may sleep many times before they eat any of us, for they consider human flesh a rare delicacy, which they do not often enjoy. I have been here for more sleeps than I can remember, and I have seen only two prisoners eaten. That is not a pleasant sight. They break all their bones with clubs, and then roast them alive. Is there no chance to escape? I asked. Not for us, he said. To escape during the storm. Their trees blew down, breaking their ropes, and they ran off into the forest with their hands still bound behind them. They will not last very long, but their deaths will be easier thus than as though they had remained here to be beaten and roasted. 
I feel very sorry for one of them. She was a beautiful girl from Sari. Dian the beautiful, the man called her. For a moment I was speechless. The shock was as great as a physical blow. Dian out in that savage forest with her hands bound behind her. I must do something, but what could I do? I started rubbing the rope that bound my wrists against the rough bark of the tree behind me. It was something no matter how hopeless. Perhaps the man who escaped with her would find a way to free her, I thought. That gave me a little hope. You say a man escaped with her? I asked. Yes. Who was he? Do you know? He was a man from Suvi. His name was Dugat. That was another terrific jolt. Of all the men in the world, that it should have been Dugat. Now more than ever I must escape. The Azarian warriors finished the palisade and lay down to sleep. They and their women and their children slept on the ground like beasts, their only shelter the shade of the trees beneath which they lay. When they awoke, the men went out to hunt. They brought back animals for they always craved flesh. The women and children gathered fruit and nuts, quantities of which were fed to us to fatten us. Sleep after sleep came and went, and constantly when I was unobserved, I rubbed my bonds against the rough bark of the tree. I knew that I was making progress, but after I gained my freedom what might I do with it? There were always Azarians inside the palisade. The palisade was too tall for me to scale, and there was but a single gate, which remained closed always, but still there was always the chance that some combination of circumstances might open the way for me. My greatest handicap, however, lay in the fact that I should have to release Zor and Cleto, for I could not desert them. They too were working to cut their bonds, but it was more than could possibly be expected that we should all achieve the desired results simultaneously. And so time dragged its slow way even in this timeless world, and my thoughts were constantly upon Dien out there somewhere alone, always in tragic danger if not already dead. But was she alone? Yes, even though Dugat had escaped with her, I was positive that she was alone if she were still alive, for she would have found some way to escape from him or she would have killed herself. Such were my unhappy thoughts as, tethered to a tree, I waited there in the compound of the man-eating giants of Azar for a horrible fate that now seemed inevitable. Chapter 18 The long Pelissidarian day dragged on. It was the same day upon which I had broken through the Earth's crust from the outer world thirty-six years before, and it was exactly the same time of day, high noon, for the stationary sun still stood at zenith. It was the same day and hour that this world was born, the same day and hour that would see its death the eternal day, the eternal hour, the eternal minute of Pellucidor. With the exception of two or three women and some half-grown children, the Azarians slept. Those who remained awake were busy around the pit in the center of the compound. It was a pit about seven feet long, two feet wide, and some foot and a half or two feet deep. They were removing ashes from it. They worked in a very slovenly manner, scooping the ashes out with their hands and throwing them upon the ground. The children, vicious little beasts, quarreled among themselves. Sometimes a woman would cuff one of them, sending it sprawling. I had never seen any sign of affection among these people, who were much lower than the beasts. When they had removed all the ashes they made a bed of dry leaves and twigs in the bottom of the pit. Over these they placed larger branches, and finally over all they placed several good-sized logs. Knowing what I did about them it was all too suggestive. They were preparing for the feast. Who would be the first victim? A kind of terror that was almost panic gripped me. The horror of such a death was born in more forcibly upon me now that I actually saw the preparations in progress. Every moment that no I was turned upon me, I worked frantically to sever my bonds. It was an arduous and fatiguing labor, made more arduous and fatiguing by the conviction that it was futile. I saw that Zor and Cleto were also working upon their bonds, but with what success I had no way of knowing. The Azarians had taken my bow and arrows and spear away from me at the time we were captured, and had left them lying there upon the ground, but they had neglected to take our knives. I presume that they felt that with our hands bound behind us we could not use our weapons. Perhaps the best reason that they had not taken them, however, was the fact that they are very stupid and unimaginative. Yet, perhaps their indifference was warranted, for what could I accomplish single handed against these huge creatures? As these thoughts were passing through my mind, I continued to work upon my bonds and suddenly I felt the last strand part. My hands were free. I still thrilled to the memory of that moment, 
But though my freedom availed me nothing it still imparted to me a new sense of self-confidence. Had I not felt the responsibility of my loyalty to Zor and Cleto, I should have made a run for it, for I was confident that I could scale the palisade at a point where it was topped by a small tree which the Azarians had leaned against it at an angle of about 45 degrees. But because of Zor and Cleto I had to abandon the idea. Presently the Azarians who had been sleeping began to awaken. Some of the males came and inspected the preparations that the women and children had been making. Then one, who appeared to be the chief, came over to us. He examined us carefully, feeling of our ribs and pinching our thighs. He stopped longest before Cleto. Then he turned to two of the warriors who had accompanied him. This one, he said. The two warriors removed her bonds. From where I stood I could see that she had almost succeeded in wearing them away but the Azarians did not seem to notice. So Cleto was to be the next victim. What could I do to prevent it? I with my puny little stone knife against all those gargantuan giants. But I determined to do something. I planned it all out carefully. When the attention of the Azarians was distracted from us, I would rush over and cut Zor's bonds with my knife. Then the two of us would throw ourselves upon them, hoping to disconcert them momentarily while at least one of us three escaped over the top of the palisade. They dragged Cleto over beside the pit, and here ensued a discussion which I could not overhear, and then something happened which gave me an inspiration. From beyond the palisade I heard the trumpeting of a mastodon. We had seen no signs of the great beasts in this locality other than the three which had followed us. Could that be old Maj himself out there looking for us? It seemed incredible, and yet there was a chance, and like a drowning man grasping for a straw, I grasped at that absurdity and raising my voice I called to the great beast as I had in the past. Instantly every eye was focused upon me, but I called again and this time louder, and from the near distance came a trumpeting reply, but the Azarians did not seem to connect the two, and turned once more to their preparations for their grisly feast. They threw Cleto to the ground and while some held her there, others went to fetch clubs with which to break her body, and then I raised my voice again and shouted loudly for Maj, then while every Azarian I was intent upon Cleto, I ran quickly to Zor and cut the remaining strands of his bonds. They come, he whispered. Listen. Yes. I could plainly hear the crashing of great bodies through the trees. The trumpeting rose to such proportions that the Azarians momentarily turned their attention from Cleto, and looked questioningly in the direction from which the disturbance came. Then of a sudden, the palisade flew apart like matchwood, and the great bulls of Maj burst into the village. The astounded Azarians stood in helpless astonishment. Zor and I rushed to Cleto's side and snatched her to her feet, and then Maj and his mate and the calf were upon us. Maj Maj, I cried, hoping that he would recognize us, and I am sure that he did. Some of the Azarians sought to protect their village with their clubs and knives, and these the mastodons lifted with their trunks and threw high into the air. Then old Maj seized me and I thought that he was going to kill me, but instead he charged on through the village and holding me low beneath his tusks, he lowered his head and crashed through the palisade on the opposite side of the village from that which he had entered. He lumbered on with me for a long time, stopping at last close to a river which ran through a broad plain. Then he set me down. I had been saved, but where were Zor and Cleto? Had they been as fortunate as I? or were they still prisoners of the man-eating giants of Azar? I was pretty well shaken by that arduous trip through the forest, for I may say that with all his good intentions old Maj had handled me rather roughly, so the moment he released me I lay down in the long grass beside the river to rest, and old Maj stood guard above me, weaving his great bulk to and fro, his little red-rimmed eyes gazing back along the trail we had come. Presently he raised his trunk and trumpeted shrilly, and immediately he was answered from the distance. I recognized the higher note of the cow and the squeal of the calf, and wondered if Zor and Cleto were with them. Presently the two mastodons came into view, but they were alone. What had been the fate of my companions? Had they escaped or were they still captives in the village of the Azarians? I was depressed not only because of my apprehension as to them, but as to my own situation as well. Had there been the slightest likelihood that I could have succored them I should have been glad to return to the village and make the attempt but it was quite unlikely that I could find my way back, and even had I been able to do so there was practically no chance that I might have been able to aid them. Their loss meant a great deal to me, for more than sentimental reasons even, 
for I had been depending upon Cleto to lead me back to the vicinity of Sari. Now without a guide and with no course to follow, the chances were very remote that I should ever reach my home again. Still further weighing down my spirits was my concern over the fate of Dien. I had escaped from the Azarians, but I was far from happy, and perhaps some worse fate lay before me in the endless and aimless wandering that lay ahead. Chapter 19 Imagine yourself the size of a microscopic microbe and that you are standing on the outside of a tennis ball, somehow miraculously suspended in space. The surface of the tennis ball would drop away from you in all directions, and no matter where you looked there would be a well-defined horizon. Suddenly you are transported to the interior of the tennis ball, which is illuminated by a stationary sun hanging in its exact center. In all directions the interior surface of the hall would curve upward, and there would be no horizon. Thus it was with me, as I stood beside that river in Pellucidor. It was as though I stood in the center of a shallow bowl some three hundred miles in diameter. The air was clear, the sun was bright, and under these conditions I assumed that the limit of my vision was about 150 miles, although of course no object was clearly discernible at such extreme distance. The periphery of my bowl merely faded off into a vignette, blending into the haze of the distance which was beyond the range of my vision. At a hundred miles, a single tree standing upon a plain was discernible, whereas a mountain was not. That was because, beneath the eternal noonday sun, the tree cast a shadow, while the mountain did not, and there being no sky to form a sharply contrasting background it simply merged with the landscape behind it and appeared as level ground. I may say that in order to recognize a tree at a hundred miles I was largely aided by my imagination, but I could easily distinguish land from water, even at the periphery of my bowl, for the water reflected the sunlight more strongly. I could see the river, upon the bank of which I stood, emptying into an ocean some fifty miles away. To me, these aspects of the Pellucidarian scene were now familiar, but you may well imagine how strangely they must have affected Perry and me when we first broke through the crust from the outer world. However, though familiar with it, I have never become entirely reconciled to the loss of a horizon. Always for some reason, it imparts to me a sense of frustration, perhaps because of a subconscious feeling that I should be seeing farther than I do. Again, notwithstanding the enormous size of my bowl, I have a quite definite feeling that I am a victim of claustrophobia. I am in a bowl from which I can never climb, because no matter how far I travel or in what direction the rim of the bowl moves steadily forward at the same rate. Fortunately for my peace of mind and my sanity, I do not let my thoughts dwell long upon this subject and I only mention these things here to give you of the outer crust a little clearer conception of some of the conditions which pertain in Pellucidor so that you may better visualize the weird scene which is now commonplace to me. As I stood there in the center of that great bowl, my only companion the great mastodons, I sought to arrive at some logical plan for the future. It was within the range of possibility that the body of water which I saw in the distance was that great ocean, uncharted and unexplored which has as many names as there are tribes along its shores. I had known it in one place as the Lural AZ, in another as the Daryl AZ, and below the land of awful shadow, the Sojer AZ. If my assumptions were correct, I might follow its shoreline to Amaz and thence to Sari. I could see islands far out upon its bosom, isles of mystery whose secrets I could never know. What strange men and beasts inhabited those emerald gems floating upon the Azure Sea? The inaccessible and the unknowable always intrigue my imagination, and once more I determined, as I had often before, that if I were fortunate enough to return to Sari, I would build a seaworthy vessel and explore the waters of Pellucidor. How little I knew of this land in which I had spent so many years! When I first came here, I spoke authoritatively upon many subjects concerning which I realize now I had little or no knowledge. I assumed, for instance, that those things which came within the range of my experience were typical of all Pellucidor. I assumed, for instance, that the Mahars, those Ramphorhynchus-like reptiles who were the dominant race of that portion of the inner world with which I was familiar, were dominant throughout the entire area of Pellucidor. But now I realize that I do not know this, for the land area of Pellucidor is enormous, and I had seen only a very tiny portion of it. Likewise my assertion that three-quarters of the surface of Pellucidor is land, giving a total land area considerably greater than that of the outer crust, 
was based solely upon Perry's theory that depressions upon the outer crust were protuberances upon the inner crust, so that land areas in Pellucidar corresponded roughly with the oceans of the outer world. But of course that is only a theory, and I do not know that it is true. With a seaworthy ship and the navigating instruments that Perry has been able to fabricate, I could become a Columbus, a Magellan, a Captain Cook, and a Balboa all rolled into one. For an adventurous spirit, the prospect was most alluring, but inasmuch as right at the moment I didn't even know my way home the realization of it seemed slightly remote, to say the least. I followed the river down toward the sea until I found a cave where I might sleep, and after gathering some berries and digging a few tubers with which to partially satisfy my hunger, I crawled in and fell asleep. As I have repeated, probably ad nauseum, I do not know how long I slept, but when I emerged from my cave the mastodons were nowhere in sight, and though I called them many times they did not appear, and I never saw them again. Now I was indeed alone, and I had never felt so lonely in my life. The company of the great beasts had not only given me a feeling of security but of companionship, and now I felt as one might feel who had lost his last friend in all the world. With a sigh, I turned my face toward the great sea, and armed only with a puny stone knife, set out once more upon my perilous and almost hopeless quest for sari. Before long I found material for weapons, and once more I set to work to fabricate a bow, some arrows, and a spear. I kept at this steadily until the job was completed. Of course, I don't know how long it took, but I was quite ready to sleep again by the time my weapons were completed. You have no idea with how much greater sense of security I faced the future, now that I was again adequately armed. As I approached the river I saw a number of low hillocks in the distance. They appeared to be devoid of vegetation, which is rather unusual in this world of lush tropical verdure, but what aroused my interest more than this was the fact that I saw a number of animals moving about upon them. They were too far away for me to identify them, but because of their numbers I assumed that they were a herd of herbivorous animals. As I had eaten no meat for some time, I welcomed the opportunity to make a kill and therefore set about approaching as close as I could to them without being seen. I found good cover in the gorge of the river from which I could not even see the hillocks, so I knew that the animals would not be able to apprehend me until I was quite close to them. I advanced cautiously and as noiselessly as possible, until I felt that I was about opposite the hillocks. Then I clambered up the steep river bank and wormed my way on my belly through long grass toward a point where I hoped to get a closer view of my quarry. The grass ended abruptly at the base of one of the hillocks, and as I emerged from it I came upon a scene that quite took my breath away. The hillocks consisted of sticks and stones and boulders of all sizes, and scurrying over them were enormous ants carrying on, on a Brobdingnagian scale, the same activities that I had watched their diminutive cousins of the outer crust engaged in upon countless occasions. The creatures were of enormous proportions, their bodies being fully six feet long, the highest point of their heads being at least three feet above the ground, and such heads they were. These enormous heads presented a most ferocious appearance with their huge eyes, their jointed antennae, and powerful mandibles. If you have watched the common ant in the garden carrying enormous loads often many times larger than themselves, you may be able to gain some slight conception of the enormous strength of these creatures. Many of them carried great boulders that it would have taken several men to lift, and I saw one with the trunk of a good-sized tree in its mandibles. I could now see that what I had thought were natural hillocks were in reality enormous ant hills. At the foot of the hills was a clearing covering many acres where numerous ants were engaged in what, despite my incredulity, I presently discovered were agricultural pursuits. They labored in symmetrically planted fields where plants and flowers were growing. The rows were straight, and the plants equally spaced. Not a weed was visible and there were rows evidently recently set out in which each plant was covered by a large leaf to protect it from the hot rays of the sun. So astounded and fascinated was I that I remained for some time watching the creatures carrying on their building operations and caring for their crops. Some of the workers in the field were collecting tender shoots from the growing plants and others extracting honey from the flowers and carrying their burdens back into the ant hills. There were streams of ants moving constantly in opposite directions to and from the hills. All was activity and bustle. I noticed that some of the ants were larger than others, and that the larger ones did no work, and then I noticed that their mandibles were much more powerful than those of their fellows, and I realized that they were the soldier ants guarding the workers. It was all very interesting, but I realized that I could not lie there on my belly in the grass forever, 
watching these formicidian activities no matter how enthralling they might be. I could never fill my belly with meat by watching ants at work. And so with a sigh of regret I arose to leave. That was an almost fatal error. Lying quietly and almost entirely concealed by the tall grasses, the ants had not perceived me, but when I arose they were instantly conscious of my presence. I do not know whether they saw me or not, for notwithstanding their large eyes it is possible that they may be blind, as some species of ants are. But ants do not need to see, since they are furnished with delicate organs of hearing in the head, in the three thoracic and two of the abdominal segments, and in the shins of the legs in addition to which their elbowed feelers or antennae are abundantly supplied with tooth-like projections connected with nerve endings which function as olfactory. Organs, therefore, though they might not be able to see me, they could certainly hear me or smell me. At any rate, they knew I was there, and several of the great soldier ants started toward me. One look at those terrible faces and formidable mandibles was enough. I turned to beat a retreat, but glancing back over my shoulder I saw that I was too late. The soldier ants were racing after me on their six powerful legs much faster than I could run. My back was to the wall. It was a case of fight or die or perhaps fight and die. I wheeled, and as I wheeled I fitted an arrow to my bow. My first shaft drove straight through one of the great eyes of the leading ant, and it dropped, writhing, to the ground. I brought down another an instant later, and then two more in quick succession, but my stand was futile. The others were upon me and I was born to the ground. I remember the thoughts that flashed through my mind that death had overtaken me at last, and that I was to die alone, and that no man would ever know how or where. My beautiful Dien if she still lived, good old Perry, and my countless other friends of the inner world would never know. I waited for a pair of those great mandibles to crush the life from me. Two of the creatures were feeling me over with their antennae, and then presently one of them picked me up by the small of my back, the pressure of the mandibles no greater than was necessary to hold me. The creature carried me as easily as you would carry a kitten, and it bore me off in that erratic manner which ants sometimes display, zigzagging to and fro, often bumping my head or scraping my feet against obstacles or other ants. Only occasionally did any of the other creatures pay any attention to me, though once or twice my captor stopped while another ant felt me over with his antennae. These, I thought, might be officers of the army or high officials. Perhaps they were inspecting me to see what I was and giving instructions for my disposal. Eventually, after wandering around aimlessly, my captor headed toward a hole near the base of an ant hill. It was not a large opening, and he had difficulty in negotiating it with me and his mandibles. Twice I got stuck crossways, which was not very pleasant as the opening was rimmed with rocks. The creature tried to push me through, but he couldn't make it, so finally he laid me down grabbed me by my legs and backed into the hole, dragging me in after him. I realized then how the flies and caterpillars felt which I had seen dragged into the nests of ants. Perhaps, as I did, they took one last, despairing look at the beautiful world that they were leaving forever. Chapter 20 Captivity is a state sufficiently harrowing, but captivity that can end only in death is infinitely worse, and when your captors are creatures with whom you cannot communicate, the horror of the situation is increased manyfold. If I could have talked with these creatures, I might have ascertained what they intended doing with me. I might even have been able to bargain for my release, but as it was, I could do nothing but wait for the end. What that would be I could only surmise, but I assumed that I had been brought in as food. The creature dragged me a short way into the interior of the hill, and then up a short ascending tunnel into a large chamber, which was evidently situated just beneath the surface of the ground, for there was an opening in the dome-like ceiling through which the sunlight poured. My first hasty survey of the chamber revealed the fact that there were a number of ants in it, three of them with enormously distended abdomens hanging from the ceiling by their feet. Occasionally an ant would come through the opening in the ceiling and apparently force something down the throat of one of these creatures, which I later learned were living reservoirs of honey which supplied food for their fellows and creatures which were being fattened for food. I recalled that, as a boy, I had read of the existence of these honeypots in some families of the Formicidae. I recalled that the idea had intrigued me, but I had always pictured ants as being tiny creatures, but now the sight of these enormously distended, pendant bodies was peculiarly revolting. My captor had dropped me unceremoniously upon the floor of the chamber, then he had gone to a couple of other ants, and they had felt each other with their antennae, 
which I came to discover was the means they adopt for communicating with one another. After this the creature left the chamber and the other ants apparently paid no attention to me. Naturally, uppermost in my mind were thoughts of escape, and seeing the ants engaged in their own affairs, I moved cautiously toward the aperture through which I had been dragged into the chamber. My hopes rose high, for I knew that I could find my way out of the ant hill, and there was a chance that I might thus escape if I moved slowly and with extreme caution so as not to attract the attention of the creatures working upon the outside of the hill. But no sooner had I reached the opening than one of the ants was upon me and seizing me in its mandibles, it dragged me back into the room. Don't waste your energy, said a voice from the shadows close to the wall. You cannot escape. I looked in the direction from which the voice had come and saw a figure huddled against the wall not far from me. Who are you? I demanded. A prisoner like yourself, replied the voice. I moved closer to the figure for that human voice had imparted to me renewed courage and renewed hope. Even though the owner of the voice were a stranger and doubtless an enemy, he promised companionship of a sort, and among these silent, ferocious insects, companionship with another of my own species was a priceless boon. The ants paid no attention to me as I moved closer to my fellow prisoner, for I was not going nearer to the doorway, and I finally was close enough to see him. No wonder I had not seen him before for in the shadowed part of the chamber close to the wall he appeared as black as night. Later I was to discover that there was a slight copper tint to his skin. You are the only other prisoner? I asked. Yes, he said. They have devoured the others. It will probably be my turn next, though it may be yours. Is there no escape? I demanded. None. You should know. You have just tried it and failed. My name is David, I said. I am from Sari. I am Yuval, he said. I come from Ruva. Let us be friends, I said. Why not, he asked. We are surrounded by enemies, and we shall soon be dead. As we talked, I had been watching an ant extracting honey from one of the honeypots depending from the ceiling. I watched it clamber down the wall and cross the floor in our direction, and then suddenly, to my surprise, it leaped upon me and threw me to the ground upon my back and holding me down, squirted honey into my mouth, forced me to swallow it too. When this force feeding was over, the creature left me. Yuval laughed as I spluttered and coughed. You will get used to it, he said. They are fattening you for food, and they won't leave it to you to choose the kind or quantity of food which you consume. They know exactly what you should have, in what quantities, and at what intervals to get the best results. They will feed you grain presently, which they have partially digested and regurgitated. It is very good and quite fattening. You will enjoy it. I shall vomit, I said disgustedly. He shrugged. Yes, perhaps at first, but after a while you will become used to it. If I don't eat, I shan't get fat, and then perhaps they won't kill me, I suggested. Don't be too sure of that, he said. I think we are being fattened for the queen and her young or perhaps for the warrior ants. If we don't get fat, we shall probably be fed to the slaves and workers. Do you think there is any advantage in being eaten by a queen? I asked. It makes no difference to me, he said. Possibly one might have a feeling of greater importance. You are joking, he asked. Naturally. We do not joke much in Ruva, he said, and certainly I do not feel much like joking here. I am going to die and I do not wish to die. Where is Ruva? I asked. You have never heard of Ruva? He demanded. No, I admitted. That is very strange, he said. It is a most important island, one of the floating islands. And where are they? I demanded. Now where would an island float? He demanded. In the sea, of course. But what sea and where? I insisted. The Bandar Az, he explained. What other sea is there? Well, I have seen the Corsar AZ, I replied. The Sojer AZ, the Daryl AZ, and the Lural AZ. There may be others, too, that I have not heard of or seen. There is only one sea, said Yuval, and that is the Bandar AZ. I have heard that far away there are some people who call it the Lural AZ, but that is not its name. If you live on an island, how do you happen to be a prisoner here on the mainland? I asked. Well, sometimes Ruva floats near the mainland, and when it does we often come ashore to hunt for meat, of which we have little on the island, 
and to gather fruits and nuts which do not happen to grow there. If we are lucky, we may take back a few men and women as slaves. I was hunting on the mainland when I was captured. But suppose you should escape. I shall not escape, he replied. But just suppose you should. Would you be able to find Ruva again? Might it not have floated away? Yes, but I would find my canoe. If I could not find it, I would build another one. And then I would follow Ruva. It moves very slowly in a slow current. I should follow it and overtake it. The ants did not bother us except to feed us, and time hung heavily upon our hands. I learned to eat the food which they forced down me without vomiting, and I recall that I slept many times. The monotony became almost insupportable, and I suggested to Yuval that, as long as we were going to be killed anyway, we might as well be killed trying to make our escape. Yuval didn't agree with me. I am going to die too soon anyway, he said. I don't want to hasten it. Once a winged ant came into the room, and all the other ants gathered around it. They were all feeling the newcomer and one another with their sensitive antennae. Oh ho! exclaimed Yuval. One of us is about to die. How do you know? What do you mean? The one with the wings has come to select a meal, possibly for the queen, possibly for the warriors. And as we are the only prisoners here, it will be one of us or maybe both. I am going to fight, I said. What with? he demanded. That little stone knife? You might kill a few of them, but it would do you no good. There are too many of them. I am going to fight, I repeated doggedly. They can't murder me without a battle. All right, said Yuval. If you want to fight, I'll fight too, but it won't do us any good. It will do me some good to kill a few of these hellish creatures. After the winged ant had conferred a while with its fellows, it came over to us and felt over our entire bodies with its antennae, sometimes pinching our flesh lightly with its mandibles. When it had completed its examination it returned again to confer with the other ants. I think you are the fattest and the tenderest, said Yuval. You mean you hope so? Well of course I do not wish to see you die, he said, but neither do I wish to die myself. However, whichever one they choose, I will fight, as you suggest. We can at least get a little revenge by killing one or two of them, I said. Yes, that will be something, he replied. The winged ant left the chamber, and after a while two of the great soldier ants came in. Again there was a conference of antennae, after which one of the ants led the two soldiers over toward us. It went directly to Yuval and touched him with its antennae. It is I, said Yuval. If they start to take you away, use your knife, and I will help you, I said. The ant that had brought the soldiers over to us went away about its business, and then one of the soldiers advanced upon Yuval with opened mandibles. Now, I called to Yuval as I drew my stone knife. Chapter 21 As the warrior ant was about to seize Yuval, he struck at it with his stone knife severing one of its antennae, and at the same instant I leaped upon it from the side, driving my knife into its abdomen. Instantly it turned upon me, trying to seize me in its mandibles, and Yuval struck again, piercing one of its eyes, while I drove my knife home several times in quick succession. The creature rolled over upon its side, writhing and floundering, and we had to beat a hasty retreat to escape the menace of its powerful legs. The other warrior ant approached its fellow and felt of it, then it backed away, apparently confused but in some way it must have communicated with the other ants in the room for immediately they became very excited, running hither and thither but finally converging upon us in a body. They were a menacing sight. Their utter silence, their horrible blank, expressionless faces carried a sinister menace that is indescribable. The creatures were almost upon us when there was an interruption from above. Rocks and debris commenced to fall into the chamber from the ceiling. And glancing up, I saw that something was tearing at the opening and enlarging it rapidly. One of the honeypots fell to the floor and burst. A long furry nose was thrust through the opening in the ceiling, and a slender tongue reached down into the chamber, licking up the ants, as more of the ceiling fell in to add further to the confusion which suddenly seized them. They seemed to forget us entirely, and immediately there was a scramble for the opening leading into the tunnel. The ants crawled over one another and jammed the entrance in panic, and constantly the great tongue licked them up, and more of the ceiling fell in. Yuval and I ran and crouched close against the wall at the far side of the chamber in an effort to escape the falling boulders, 
while above us the beast tore away with powerful claws as it sought to enlarge the opening. The long, powerful tongue sought out every corner of the room. Twice it passed over our bodies, but each time it discarded us as it sought for more ants. When there were no more left, the tongue and the head were withdrawn from the great hole that the creature had made in the top of the ant hill. The chamber was filled with debris that reached to the edge of the great rent in the ceiling. It formed an avenue of escape, and there was not an ant in sight. Come, I said to Yuval, let's get out of here before the ants recover from their confusion. Together we scrambled up the pile of rubble, and when we stood again in the open there was not an ant in sight, but there was a colossal ant bear, as large as an elephant, digging at another part of the hill. In appearance the creature was almost identical with the South American ant bear of the outer crust but highly specialized as to size, because of the enormous ants upon which it fed. Perry and I had often speculated upon the amazing similarity between many of the animals of Pellucidor and of the outer crust, and Perry had formulated a theory to explain this which I believe is based on quite sound reasoning. It has been quite clearly demonstrated that at some time in the past, Tropical conditions existed at what are now the Arctic regions, and it is Perry's belief that at this time animals passed freely through the polar opening from the outer crust to the inner world, but be that as it may there was a great ant bear, and to it we owed our lives. Animated by a common impulse, Yuval and I hastened away from the ant hills and down toward the ocean, and I may say that I never left any place before with a greater sense of relief, not even the village of Misa, king of the Jukins. At the edge of the surf, Yuval stopped and gazed out across the ocean, shading his eyes with his hand as he strained them into the distance. As I followed his gaze I was suddenly struck with a change in the seascape since last I had seen it. That is strange, I said. What? demanded Yuval. The last time I looked out across this water, there were islands out there. I saw them distinctly. I could not have been mistaken. You were not mistaken, said Yuval. They were the floating islands of which Ruva is one. And now you will never see your own country again, I said. That is too bad. Of course I shall see it again, said Yuval. That is, if I am not killed as I am going to it. But even if you had a boat, how would you know in what direction to go? I asked. I will always know where Ruva lies no matter where it is. I do not know how. I simply know. He pointed. Beyond the range of our vision it lies directly there. Now here was a new phase of that amazing homing instinct which is inherent to all Pelucidarians. Here was a man whose country floated around aimlessly possibly upon a great ocean, at the mercy of tide and current and wind, yet no matter where it might be Yuval, given means of transportation could go directly to it, or at least so he thought. I wondered if it were true. The point on the coast at which Yuval had left his canoe was in the direction that I had intended going, so I went with him to look for it. If it is not there, he said, I shall have to build another, and while I am doing it, Ruva will have drifted much farther. I hope that I shall find my boat. Find it he did, where he had hidden it among some tall reeds in a tiny inlet. Yuval said that he had to make a number of spears before attempting the long journey in search of Ruva. He said that he should probably be attacked many times by sea monsters during the trip, and the only weapon that he could use against them with any degree of success was long spear. We shall have to have many of them, he said. We? I repeated. I am not going with you. He looked astonished. You are not, he demanded. But where will you go? You have told me that you don't know how to find your way to your own country. You had much better come with me. No, I said. I know that Sari does not lie out in the middle of an ocean and that if I went there I should never find it, whereas if I stick to the seashore I may eventually come to it, if this is as I think the ocean near which it lies. It is not as I had planned, he said, and I thought that his tone was a little sullen. I'll stay with you until you shove off, I told him, for I have to make more weapons for myself, a short spear, a bow and some arrows. He asked me what bow and arrows were as he had never heard of them. He thought that they might be handy and in some ways better than a spear. Once again I set to work making weapons. It may seem to you that I had very bad luck with my weapons, constantly losing them as I did, but making them entailed very little work as they were most crudely done. However, they had always answered my purpose. And after all, that is the only thing that matters. 
Yuval kept reverting to the subject of my accompanying him. He seemed absolutely set upon it and was continually trying to persuade me to change my mind. I couldn't understand why he was so insistent for he had never given the slightest indication of harboring any affection for me. Accident had thrown us, two alien people, together. And about the most that one might say about it was that we were not unfriendly. Yuval was a fine-looking chap. And in the bright sunlight he was a deep black with a copper glint. His features were quite regular. And he was all in all quite handsome. The first man-like creatures I had seen on Pellucidor, when Perry and I first broke through the crust from the outer world, were black men. But they were arboreal creatures with long tails and low in the scale of human evolution. Yuval, however, was of an entirely different type and I should say, fully as intelligent as any of the white race of Pellucidor that I had seen. After I had finished my weapons, I helped him with the making of his spears as I had promised to stay with him until he sailed. At last, the weapons were completed and the boat stocked with water and food. The former he carried in sections cut from large, bamboo-like plants, which, he maintained, would keep the water fresh indefinitely. His food supply consisted of tubers and nuts, a diet that would be varied by the addition of such fish as he might be able to spear en route. When all was ready, he suggested that we sleep before separating so that we might both be fresh for the start of our journeys. Just before I awoke I dreamed of Dien. She had taken both my hands in hers, and then in one of those weird transformations which occur in dreams, she suddenly became a Hartford, Connecticut, policeman, fettering my hands behind me with handcuffs. Just as the lock snapped I awoke. I was lying on my side and Yuval was standing over me. It was a moment before I gathered my wits, and when I did I found that in fact my hands were bound behind my back. At first I couldn't realize what had happened to me. The recollection of the dream still clung persistently in my mind. But what was Yuval doing in it? He didn't belong in the same picture with a cop from Hartford, Connecticut. And where was the cop? Where was Dien? Presently my brain cleared, and I realized that I was still alone with Yuval, and that it must have been he who had bound my hands behind my back. But why? Yuval, I demanded. What's the meaning of this? It means that you are going to Ruva with me, he replied. But I don't want to go to Ruva. That's the reason I bound your hands. Now you'll have to go. You can't do anything about it. But why do you want me to come with you? Yuval thought for a moment before he answered, then he said, Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't know, because there's nothing you can do about it. I'm taking you back to Ruva as my slave. Where I come from, I said, you'd almost qualify as a rat. What's a rat? he asked. I had used the English word, which of course he did not understand. You are almost. A rat has some redeeming qualities, I suppose, though I don't know just what they are. You have none. You accepted my friendship. Together we suffered imprisonment and faced death. Together we fought against a common enemy for our freedom. Together we escaped. And now you bind me in my sleep, planning to take me back to your country as your slave. What's wrong with that? He demanded. You are not a Reuven, therefore we are enemies. You should be glad that I didn't kill you while you slept. I let you live because a man with slaves is an important man in Ruva. Now that I have a slave I shall be able to get a mate. No woman of Ruva, who is worth having, will mate with a man who has no slaves. It takes a brave man and a fine warrior to capture a slave. The way you did? I do not have to tell them how I got you, he said. But I can tell them, I reminded him. You won't though, he said. And why? Because a man may kill a bad slave. My hands will not always be bound behind my back. I said. Nevertheless with my friends I can kill you if you tell this about me. I shall tell no lies. You had better tell nothing. Come, we'll be going. Get up. He gave me a kick in the ribs. I was furious but helpless. It is not easy to get up when your hands are bound behind your back, but with the aid of head, shoulder and elbow I finally got to one knee and then to my feet. Yuval pushed me, none too gently, toward his canoe. Get in he commanded. I sat down in the bow. Yuval cast off and took his place in the stern. With his great paddle he headed the frail craft out of the inlet toward the open sea, and thus commenced a journey on an uncharted ocean in a frail craft, without sextant or compass, toward a destination that was constantly shifting its position.